that's a cool T-shirt. Okay, <laughs> my name's Dave. Um, we've been working a lot to prepare this track, uh, but it's going to be about interactions. How do you build awesome, innovative interactions? And we have incredible speakers that come from different places, Austin, um, New York, and also local. And um, then let me introduce the first speaker. Uh, it's Ben, Ben Brown. Ben has been working in the Loves Bots. He's been working in the community f since 90s. He's been a designer, a programmer. Uh, he's also an entrepreneur, runs his own company. Um, he loves not only bots, I think he also has a lot about tacos, and maybe he will tell us about his taco story. Um, why, why, why does Ben is going to speak? Um, it's because he, he built this awesome uh, framework that everybody uses to create a bot called BotKit. Okay. And um, very soon Ben will give you some more information, but also about the BotKit Studio that helps you create tools, tooling, so that you can easily take your bot to production. And all that said, I will leave it to Ben to present you this technology. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Is that, am I on? Yeah, good. Does that work? Yeah, awesome. So, uh, thanks so much for the intro. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to share uh, some information about building bots with you guys. Um, it, building bots for the enterprise, I had to do this, right? That's the enterprise bot data. Uh, I have no good joke about that, except that I was like, ah, oh, the title is Building Bots for the Enterprise. I have to have a picture of data. So anyways. So um, I am the uh, CEO of a company called Howdy. Uh, we are in Austin. Uh, and we were one of the first companies to build uh, a dedicated Slack bot application um, right before actually the Slack platform even launched. Uh, and I am also the creator of BotKit, as Steph mentioned, uh, the mo one of the most popular open source frameworks for building bots and other kind of conversational software. Um, you know, people are really excited about bots right now, and uh, there's a lot of talk about like how it's this new sort of phenomenal thing. But um, that is not really the case. Um, when we first started, you know, I went back and I looked at the like long history of bots, and it really goes back to the '60s with this guy Joseph Weizenbaum, who created a bot called Eliza, like way, way, you know, in the '60s. And it was just, it, you know, a fairly simple set of code that, uh, you know, fit in fit on a couple of pages of printout. Uh, I, I found like a magazine article that was like, type this code in and you'll get your Eliza bot. But, it, but, but, the, and, but the point is that Eliza convinced people who were working on it that it was a real person on the other side. Right? It was a very simple thing, but like, it, it was effective enough that people were like, wow, that's a, that's a shrink on the other side of this chat room who's like, caring about what I say. Um, so, so this guy like, was actually the sort of forefather for all the stuff that's going on right now. But it was, oops, wrong button. Not just that, like, it, uh, the first time the, the Vint Cerf uh, connected computers to, together across from Stanford to um, uh, some, some college on the East Coast, I can't remember, um, they actually took Eliza and this other bot called Perry and they put them into a chat room and they talked. So this is a, you know, a, um, a RFC from 1973 that shows like chatbots chatting with each other across the you know the sort of first the dawn of the internet, uh, totally crazy. And it's like bots saying funny things to each other. Like not much has changed. And then even in the like early 2000s, there was this bot called Smarter Child that was on AOL Instant Messenger that reached like 90 million people. So. You know, when we were first starting out, like, are bots going to be a thing? Do people know how to use bots? Is this going to be just too much for people to deal with? Like, we looked at these kind of things like, no, it's fine. People will get it. In fact, we think that, like, pe nobody really wanted to, like, sit in front of a, key a typewriter attached to a television. They really wanted, from the very beginning, to, like, talk to an intelligent machine. And we're finally actually able to start, start realizing that, that vision. Um, you know, this is another reason why that pe people are talking about bots now, right? You, you, a lot of you have probably seen this kind of chart, but like social, social messaging and messaging in, in the workplace is extremely, extremely, extremely popular. You know, people spend more time in these social messengers than they do in any other kind of apps on their mobile phone, and there are billions and billions of people in these, in these platforms, and very, very few apps. Um, this is a quote from uh, Phil Libin, who's, a, who's the creator of Evernote and is now uh, 
a, an investor who's done a lot of investment in bots. But you know, what he's excited about is not that you can, you know, you can. It's not about AI necessarily. It's not about uh, a, a social spreading or virality or anything like that. It's about the fact that, like now, we can have software participating in the normal conversations and enhancing those conversations, you know, with services and functionality that comes to us without uh, us having to think about. I'm going to go use some software, right? Um, you know. I'll augment the stream with re rela relevant context and functionality. So that could be something as simple as, you know, I'm talking about a bug in Jira, and the bot automatically recognizes that and brings it into my chat room, uh, or you know, or it could be a lot, lot more complicated kind of transactional things. Uh, and you know, we talk about messaging bots right now, uh, but really the way we see it is that this is the beginning of you know a major shift in the way that people are going to interact with software of all kinds. Um, so, it, you know, text messaging right now in, in, in platforms like Slack, Cisco Spark, Facebook Messenger, but then there's voice uh, that, that they're sort of this underpinning technologies are, are very similar or the same. So we have, you know, Alexa, Siri, Cortana, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Samsung's new thing, et cetera. And then, and then beyond that, there's this world that where all these technologies come together, right? That, that, it, that it's like robotics and AR and VR and all these things where we're not sitting in front of computers with buttons. We're now, you know, gesturing and talking to the software and it has to understand and respond to us intelligently. So, you know, in businesses today, these things are, are, are fairly well deployed. Um, you know, and they're doing all sorts of really interesting and, and fairly valuable kinds of transactions, like collecting expense reports, doing sales goals, running stand-ups for people. And then they're also doing like silly things like taking lunch orders or like, you know, making jokes in the channel. Um, but, 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 you know, businesses are, are, are implementing these things right now um, in their, you know, in their Slack channels, in their uh, Spark channels. Um, and, and more and more, they're realizing, like, not only are these things valuable to us inside, but they're also valuable to us, uh, to, the, to our customers. So, you know, we deal with, uh, with at Botkit, we deal with two primary scenarios. <clears throat> One, like I said, is that building, for, building a bot for your team, right? If you can build a bot that like, takes over the repetitive tasks that your team spends a lot of time on, they will never go back to doing that task again manually, right? It frees up permanently resources and time that would otherwise be spent like, doing the same thing over and over again. And like, I would just use a, like, a stand-up meeting as an example. You know, every single time you have a stand-up meeting, somebody's got to go get the all, collect all the information, you know, take notes, put those notes on the internet, you know, make sure that everybody saw the notes. If a bot does it, it happens automatically every single time. Nobody, it, you know, never misses a meeting and never misses a note, right? Perfect, perfect accuracy. Um, so there's no reason to go back. Um, and, uh, you know, bots built for internal use can, like, provide new and exciting and easier to use, more contextual access to all of the legacy software that you might have in your enterprise company. Um, that like may, may not have a nice web interface or a mobile interface or nice API, but you can wrap a bot around that and provide those tools directly to people in those chat rooms. The other scenario is external use, right? So like marketing bots or bots that are sort of like the, the conversational version of the app or service that you provide. Um, these, there are, there are uh, now a wealth of app stores and distribution platforms for these kind of things, um, and you can embed them in your, in, your, in your website, you can put it in your app, but you know, eventually, our, our belief is that any kind of software that you build is going to need to be you know, in SMS, on an Alexa, in a Slack, or something like that. Um, so it, you know, now is the time to start uh, adopting and experimenting and learning these skills. When I, like I said, when I started doing this a couple of year, years ago as, as, uh, you know, as our startup, we looked back and we said, like, what, what is available out there to teach people how to do this? And, like, this is one of the books that, this is one of the only books available about bots, which was published in 1997 by Wired. And it's really about, like, software. You know, it's not even really about bots. It has nothing, like, uh, educational in it. There, there, was a, there was also a PDF from the, from the game company that made the You Don't Know Jack uh, DVD games, and like that was one of the most useful and canonical documents about like d developing conversational user interfaces that existed. Uh, you know, it's from the 90s. So, um, you know, how does a company actually build software using all of these kind of components? 
it, it, it's very similar to mobile development or web development, where it's not just you know you sit down and write all of the code. Um, there are all sorts of components that, that, are, that exist that you have to utilize and weave together into the final application. So there's the messaging APIs, right? Like just the messages coming in and out from the messaging platforms. There's natural language processing, which I'll talk about in a second. There's content management, analytics, monitoring, you know, other types of AI, business logic, all of those things. Plus, you have to know and sort of have experience with taking these things, putting them together, and like building the final application. So. This is the reason that we created Botkit, right? It's one set of tools that any company can use to build a conversational piece of software onto any, you know, any of the platforms. And we see it as not, not just as a you know, set of software development tools, but really like a skill, right? Like you, the, the way we used to have webmasters, we, we're, we're trying to create like bot, bot masters. Um, people who know how to build conversational software of all different kinds, who have a skill set that can be applied to these different platforms um, and, 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 and you know, take, uh, you know, bring software to these different um, experiences. So why Botkit? So it's open source. Uh, the core of the library is free to use, MIT license, which means like anybody, any one of you could take it, fork it, and create a commercial product and never look back. Um, it's, it's, it's extensively documented. You know, I would say most of the time that we spend as a team is actually on maintaining our documentation and examples. Um, very, very, very important to us. There are 40, 40, more than 40 uh, open source plugins that allow you to take advantage of all of the NLP tools that are available. Uh, human takeover, which means like s a user has trouble, uh, you know, in the process of using the bot, and a, a real person can take over and operate that bot. Um, CRM analytics and all, all sorts of stuff. And Botkit's already out there. It's been downloaded a quarter million times since it since it was launched. And it's you know we see in our in our stats, you know, more than 40,000 teams have bots uh, with Botkit on them, um, and, and as well as Facebook uh, Facebook pages and things like that. So okay. Uh, how a bot basically works, right? Messages come into an application from a messaging platform, most, most of the time via an HTTP webhook. So somebody in, in uh, Facebook says a thing, your bot gets a, a simple webhook with the like, text and user ID of that user. So the application then has to process that message and like, do something with it and prepare a response. Uh, and then the, the message gets sent back to the API, to the messaging API, and it appears in the client. So where Botkit is, is, is that middle piece, right? So Botkit does an enormous amount of the lifting of like connecting the webhooks into a session and identifying the user and figuring out like what they said before and what their preferences are and things like that. So you, the developer, don't have to actually deal with that at all. You just have to uh, sort of teach your robot to talk. Um, so this is sort of how it works. Um, I, this is my very, very simplistic uh, example of like the enterprise, um, different than some s s you know smaller companies. You know, on the outside you have the messaging platform, the outside of your network, outside of your firewall. There's the messaging platform, and inside the messaging platform is your bot application. Um, this is you know this is fairly important because those messages actually contain you know your company's intellectual property and all of the like you know, everything that is being said, or a lot of what is being said in those, in those private chat rooms. So you want to make sure that those messages don't get splattered out all over the internet. Um, so here's what a, a very, very simple bot kit application looks like. So you have a controller object, which is like the bot's brain. And then there's a function called hears. That's, that tells the bot to listen for certain keywords, or phrases, or patterns, or regular expressions, or intents. So in this case, it's just listening for the phrase something. And then it, there's a function called reply that sends the message back, right? Very, very simple. You're not dealing with APIs or protocols. This could be an Alexa skill. This could be a, a, a Slack bot. This could be a Facebook bot. It doesn't really matter. Here's a slightly more complicated example. So in this case, instead of just like saying, hearing a thing and saying something back, I'm starting a conversation, like defining a session, and there's multiple messages being sent back and forth. So it says, oh, hello, what is your name? It waits for the user to answer, and then it, it says, oh, hello, Ben. Um, again, you can see, like, this is, a, this is, this is like six, in, six webhooks in and out, right? So you, you don't have to deal with any of that um, or, or any of the background details of, of like, m protocols, message formatting, things like that. Uh, Here's, here's a slightly even more complex thing. So you know, do you want to play a game is the question. And then the parameter to that function is, 
is a list of potential options. So this is sort of multi-choice question that you, could, that you could ask. So if the user says something like yes, it's going to do one thing. If the user says something like no, it's going to do another thing. And if they say anything else, it repeats the same question. So again, we're just trying to give tools to people who like come from web and native uh, programming, you know, who are, who are used to web pages and forms and field validation and submit events. Um, tools that, are, that, that, that like feel like the same kind of thing that they've done before and don't make you understand the like black box magic of NLP. Okay, so like I said, you want to, in the enterprise, you probably want all of this stuff that your bot is doing to stay behind that firewall. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but the, the top two would be like your bot shouldn't be tied to some external service for you know, uh, availability reasons. You don't want to be dependent on somebody else. And you also don't want your user's data or those messages to go out over the internet. Um, and and, and not, not, not to mention the fact that you probably have internal resources that you want uh, the bot to, to take advantage of that might not necessarily be on the internet. So these bots can actually live like on the same server as your web server, or like in the same data center as your API, and can use private networking to, to access you know, privileged resources. So, uh, you know, I showed some simple, simple examples where it's like looking for a string, right? A keyword in a string. That only gets so far. Uh, you know, eventually, uh, many bots want to start using natural language processing APIs. Uh, and what's, what, what's great about building bots right now is that there's an enormous wealth of uh, tooling uh, that, that are coming from these big companies like IBM and Microsoft and Google and Facebook and Amazon. And they're basically giving it all away for free, right? This is like decades of AI research that is now being like, turned into consumer APIs that are free or cheap to use. Um, and you know what these guys do? Um, I have a slide here. You know these NLP services take the messages that that, that are sent to your bot or, or that are sent to their API, and they do some like algorithmic machine learning magic, uh, and then out comes um, an intent, right? Which is basically translating arbitrary user text to like a one of a a predefined list of actions the bot can take. Super super handy. Um, allows your bot to like, respond to a much broader set of input um, and, 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 and learn from the, the actual input uh, messages that the users are sending. But you know, if you use Lewis, you're sending those messages, those messages are coming across your firewall, and then you're sending them back out across, you know, back out and then back in, and you're leaving a trail of those messages you know, all over Microsoft servers. You know, the same goes with, with, with Facebook, Google, Amazon, et cetera. So that is a less than an ideal situation. And when we talk to our large cus customers, you know, they say, like, I'd love to be able to use Microsoft tool, but, you know, I can't send those messages out, out of my network. Um, now, of course, if you have great relationships with one of these guys, they have all the stuff that you could possibly want. And each one of these groups has, like, cognitive services that are available to, like, sort of satisfy all of your needs. If you want to, like, send your messages to Azure or Bluemix or who knows what, uh, Facebook. Um, so, uh, you know, what's nice is that uh, the, the open source world has, has provided. And so there's a, a, an NLP stack called Rasa which is a uh, self-hostable um, open source drop-in replacement for these, all these other NLP services. So it actually, Rasa actually will run in a, um, a Lewis mode, or an Echo mode, or a uh, WIT mode, or an API to AI mode. So you can actually use both or kind of trade, trade off back and forth. But in the end, you can own your own training data, operate your own NLP classification service, and you know, make sure that that data stays secure inside your network. Super cool. So that there's that you know. So then again, we get our our clean um, network diagram of that data and that user stuff staying staying inside the inside, inside the network. So another thing uh, that you, that 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 you tend to need as your bot gets more complex and you know is in production and you want to like justify and validate its existence is analytics. There are a great set of tools out there for bot and specifically for bot analytics. Uh, Dashbot is one. Uh, bot Analytics is another. Chatbase is a, a, a Google just launched this thing called Chatbase. It's not even publicly available yet, but it's sort of like Google Analytics for your bot. And then there's GetBot Metrics, 
uh, and there's an asterisk there next to that because that one is also open source and can be run in your own in your own network. Super super nice set of tools. All of these guys have things like retention analytics, um, you know, messages sent, session length, uh, all of that kind of stuff that's really really useful to um, to understanding how people are using your bot. And then the other piece is content management. Uh, you know. AI, or the NLP is great. It, you know, an intent has been determined, right? Like, you know what the user wants. But then you have to provide that user the information or services that they want, and you have to, like, manage them through a flow. You have to uh, uh, provide them help, uh, help information, you know, uh, onboarding experience, um, you know, all, all manner of things. You have to uh, format your search results, you know, any, all, all that kind of stuff. So how, how do you actually do that? Um, you know, WIT, API, Watson, they provide simple versions of this uh, where you can sort of, for each uh, classified intent, you get a response back. Um, we feel that that is fairly, or too limiting. Um, so we, uh, as Stev mentioned, we created a tool called BotKit Studio that allows you to define the whole, the entirety of the interaction in, in, a, in, a, in a single script. Um, uh, today, for what it's worth, we are announcing that uh, you can now build uh, Cisco Spark bots in BotKit Studio. So uh, using Studio, you can go from like, I want to build a bot, to the bot is alive and operating in Cisco Spark, backed by our APIs, and running on your own hardware in a couple of minutes. Um, we have the end-to-end the -end process uh, managed for you. Uh, and I'm just uh, really, really quick. So here's what that looks like. Uh, I go into our IDE, I say build a bot for Cisco Spark. We also support Slack and Facebook in there. Um, here is a uh, quick, is this an animation? Yeah, so here's the IDE. It looks like a chat room, but I'm like pretending to be the bot. I'm like role playing the bot. So each one of these messages is an editable entity with all of the various properties available. I can add conditional actions and uh, uh, data validators, um, reference uh, NLP intents, and like take actions like, in this case, I'm saying, um, if the user says quit, mark the transaction as failed, and then I can, in the, in the uh, stats window, yeah, actually measure like the conversion rate of this kind of interaction. Uh, that was supposed to be a screenshot, uh, but botkit.ai is our website. I have a workshop at 4 where I'm going to go into a lot more detail about this stuff, and then we're also demoing in the demo room, so uh, please come by and say hi. Thanks. Congrats. Man. And we are very privileged to have Ben uh, here. Um, ben is holding a, a demo pod, then you can continue the conversation with Ben just in between the talks and also the workshop. And we will also be playing a 45 minute classroom about bots where we will be able to go into details about uh, what it takes to build a bot and to take it to the next level. This will be right after this, this slot of sessions. Okay, now at I think two fifteen.